getting three per light, man. And does it matter anymore, man? It's about weight. It's about quality. Come on, you want bullshit? Only if you schwazed it right, bro. Only if you schwazed it right. Yeah. I don't know what the exact technique, but yeah, I don't know. Three per light's pretty heavy. We got some hands up here. We got some experts, man. Um, before we do, we'll always say, hey, guys, hop into the live chat. Comment, like, subscribe. We're going to be trying watching the chat a little bit more, trying to get you involved. And, uh, yeah, should we introduce our growers, our panel, the dudes that grow panel? Hey, first off, man, I, that is the best AI background ever. Grandpa, can you make my background look like dudes? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nah, man. Visiting the folks in Cali, having a good time. Yeah. Glad to be here. Hell yeah. Ah, some great palm trees behind you, man. Great palms. Come on, introduce our, our panel, will you, man? Hey, we'll do it professional. First off, Scotty Haley out of Pueblo, Colorado. We have Rasta Jeff with Irie Genetics. He has some heavy hitting strains. Yes. And host of the Grow From Your Heart podcast. Welcome, Rasta Jeff. What's up, guys? Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It was a pleasure. Thank you for coming. Thanks for hanging out, man. Um, I don't know if I can do so so good, but uh, Hot Rod Grows is here, man. He's just my friend from down in Denver that grows crazy dank. And uh, you press your own? Are you a rosin presser or washing and squishing? Yes, yeah, sir. Right. washing and Washing and squishing, bro. But respect, man. Just a, a great grower. Uh, DGC Cup. Uh, uh, what'd you get? Top ten. Let's top. Just say top ten. That's good. All right, Dan, all right. I thought you were a top. All right, whatever. Um, uh, good to have you, brother. Thank you for coming on up. You're live in studio. Yes. You gave me a big fat dab beforehand, <laughs> which certainly changed the trajectory here. But come on, let's party. Yes, sir. How's everybody doing tonight? I'm Excellent. doing great, sir. Great. Well, that's, <laughs> the chat says they're doing great, too, man, except for Bechtopia. She's feeling cantankerous. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it over to Michigan. Matt, obviously, straight out of Michigan, commercial grower, good old friend, good old DGC. Not to peg you as old Michigan, Matt, but been hanging out for a minute, always come to the shows, have a good time. And when I want somebody to lean on, man, as far as asking, is this product worth it? What are you doing? You ask somebody that's growing a lot of plants and looking at, like, price per gram inputs. So welcome, Michigan Matt, to the show. Thank you for having me. Thanks, guys, and uh, looking forward to doing this. Yeah. Hey, thank you all for coming and for coming. I don't know. Is that the best you get in virtual reality for showing up on Zoom, man? Uh, but hey, we talked to some beginner growers, uh, growing techniques, you know, some of the basics uh, last live. Uh, this time I thought that's why I invited y'all specifically. We could maybe talk about some more advanced stuff once you got your grow going. Uh, to really dial it in, man, to go from, let's say like you're growing eight weed, seven, eight, and you want to dial it up to that nine, 10 weed. You know, there is a big difference, man. Yeah. I don't know. I thought we'd talk about it. Yay. Yeah. Yay. All right. <laughs> hey, Matt. So if you, you walk into my grow and, uh, I'm like, I'm like, Hey man, it's looking good. What's the first thing you're looking at? What's the first, uh, uh, yeah. The first thing you'd be looking at. The first thing I always look at is what is your environment? What is the room like that's around your plants? First thing I always want to do is I want to dial into VPD as best as possible for where I am in the growth phase. And then just really make sure that everything around there is in working parameters. Because if something is out of whack, then we know that we can start eliminating things if there's issues going on in the garden. Okay, so you just we said... Have to, we have to have a perfect, uh, nearly a perfect garden to get to that 10, so... So since we're trying to dial things up, VPD, vapor pressure deficit, uh, an oversimplification would be the combination of temperature and humidity. Uh, it's a little bit more than that in science, but uh, you tell me. Explain VPD to me, man. I want to get well, better Well, so the growing. way that I like to explain it is like uh, going to Florida, right? You go to Florida and the plants are very lush. Everything is growing at like a really high capacity and it grows the best citrus and the best plants down there but look at the atmosphere that's going around when we're, i mean you guys coming from a dry spot in colorado i'm sure you feel it too but when we come from michigan and say the winter and we go down to florida the first thing that blasts us in the face is that humidity so the first thing i want to do is make sure that my humidity is enough to to make that plant thrive so the first thing i'm looking at is my humidifier and making sure that you know in veg that i can hit 70 percent humidity but we also have to start worrying about your temperatures at that point too, because we got to create that VPD range that's gonna uh, allow the plants to thrive, obviously. So um, yeah, take it. Yeah, I guess. So can I throw in from the chat? 
Yeah. Um, Lee Davis says, this is a great tip. Now, when you're checking your VPD, make sure you're considering your leaf, leaf surface temperature. That's and what your true. offset is. Yeah, because think about it. The temperature in your room isn't the same as the temperature of your leaf. No, absolutely. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of the parameters that go into that. Like if you ever just sit in a hot room and you have a fan hit your face, it feels a little cooler than what the ambient temperature actually in that room is. The plant's feeling the same thing. If it's getting hit with a fan or it's getting a direct uh, blast of the air conditioning, it's going to get a different temperature than maybe in a different corner of the room. So leaf surface temperature is extremely important. And that's not really hard to measure. You get one of those little $15 little uh, you know, lasers that you point. Uh, yeah, yes. a little temp gun. Yeah. So the perfect temperature and the perfect humidity so because the plant is pulling up that moisture so it can just flow through. You know, and it, the more water or nutrient solution that's flowing through there, the more the plant can, uh, uh, yeah, can thrive. All right, that makes sense. So now if we have an issue or a deficiency somewhere within the room, we can start eliminating factors and start going down the list to make sure that it's not an environmental thing that's causing whatever the issue might be. So. All right, Hot Rod. So if I'm asking you, even if I just say, hey, man, I'm building a grow. I got some money to spend. What are the top three things I should consider? What should I be building my grow around? What would you say? Start off with, like he said, the environment's number one. Yeah. And then number two would be consistency. No matter what, like... If it's 90 degrees outside in the summertime, making sure you can hit your VPD properly. Or if it's negative 10 degrees here in Colorado, making sure you can still hit your VPD properly. Oh, so, man, I didn't think about it. You're right, man. It has to perform in the winter. Like, my room's out in the pole barn. Yeah, so if yeah. you got the money, making sure you can spend the money on heaters, humidifiers, Insulation is cheap. Whatever you need. <laughs> you know? Yeah, make sure. So consistency. So making sure your week four is the same in March and week four is the same in April as it is in, like, October. Yeah, yeah. You know, Rasta I like Harry Jeff. Sampson here. Sorry, in the chat, Harry Sampson says, "Stay naked in your tent. You'll feel your grow." Kind of goes with uh, the gardening naked movement. You know, get oh. that skin, that skin surface temperature. <laughs> yeah, man. I only want to. All right, we'll talk about that. That's a segue I could talk <laughs> there's about. There's a there's a lot that not. goes into that though. The, using your senses when you go into the room. You know, using all your senses. What does it sound like? It usually does. Does it smell like it usually does? There's something that goes into that feel and knowing that feel, you know, translates to those plants being in a good environment too, a consistent environment. Hey, Rasta Jeff, I cannot believe that anybody has not said genetics yet. That's number three. You know, <laughs> that, that's uh, the number one thing for me, being the seed guy, genetics. Uh, if you put a bunch of uh, Steve Urkels in the room, you're never going to get uh, LeBron James out of there. You know what I mean? It's never going to work. So genetics, genetics, genetics. And then not just to be the sales guy, but the next step is to uh, run that genetic repeatedly. Once we do have that room right, run something repeatedly. People like to switch. They like to grow this strain this time, this strain next time. Build a relationship with your plant. That's something that we should also include in this. Uh, that takes multiple grows, but learn the plant. Why not? We're growing plants. Why not look at the plants? Uh, before we had monitors, before we had Google, before we had all this stuff, we had to look at the plants. Our eyes tell us Everything, if the if we look at the plants right, the plants are all the monitors. So build a relationship with that plant before we even uh, start going too far with the room. Start understanding the plant. Read, read some books and get good genetics and then understand the plant that you're growing. Instead of growing like this clone and that clone, pick something you're going to fall in love with and run it like seven times and then see what it really does. Like Hot Rod said, it's going to react differently uh, in that winter crop and the summer crop. You'll notice a difference. Uh, start seeing what it really does and does not like. Treat it. Like, try to take notes and understand that plant. Treat it like you're falling in love with it. Hey, and Matt. This is going to be the number one thing. The commercially, how, how many strains do you all run? And then how do you select your strains? What is that all about? Do you all do your own so, phenol hunts? Or? We have about 21, roughly, plant, uh, strains within the, the facility. But what, what we do, we, we're as, it's just absolutely right. We want to run those strains multiple times before we really get a feel of what that strain can do. And when we're looking at what a strain can do, we're not only looking at performance of this, the plant and the, how much it's yielding, but we're looking at performance of uh, the employees and what the, uh, the inputs that it takes to grow the plant. So does it take a longer time to prune it? Does it take uh, a longer time to trim it, to harvest it? You know, and then we take all these factors and what we like to do is build kind of like a scale. And with our scale, uh, we'll start with like THC percent. We have four categories in our scale. We have THC percentage, yield, uh, trim input, and uh, labor input. 
And if it's a five, then it is the absolute best strain that we could have of that category. So like a five could be like a 30% THC strain. So we add all those up at the end and we get a better idea of like what strains perform the best for us in certain situations. Because now that we're in the winter season, we're starting to see a surplus in flower. So, so to compensate to that, we need, we have uh, dispensaries that don't always just want the 30% flower. They want to buy flower that's at the cheaper price point. So for us, we have to be able to produce a crop that can hand a crop that can handle or a strain that can handle that. Um, doing that. So kind of going back, we run set, we have seven tables in a room. So we're able to run seven strains at a time and that we're, that we're doing it at kind of like a smaller scale. What kind of, I mean, you see huge variations in what you're growing and I'm kind of setting a, a little softball because yeah, there are just some plants that actually want to hit the ceiling and want to grow right into the lights. And how do you account for that? So if we get, have a strain that, that wants to stay small and only maybe, uh, grow 25 to 50 percent from what it was in veg versus 100 to 200 percent uh we'll rate that a strain a higher higher than some other uh, strains in those categories right because it's obviously going to take less to prune it but then we take into into consideration the yield so then if it starts yielding what a tall lengthy plant can yield as well um then we have a pretty good idea to be able to run something that's a little kind of easier on the on the employees it's easier on the trim crew uh, it's just better for us to produce. And you're talking to something that has a little bunch of little popcorn nugs that's dank is. Well, AF. like the, so the GMO type uh, stretchy strains, right? We we want to do a little bit less of that and more of, uh, I don't know, you guys are pretty familiar with Scroopy Noopers, right? That's a smaller stout plant that can grow pretty big sure. size nugs. Um, that's like kind of something more advantageous to us, especially like with us, we have a smaller crew. And that we want to avoid burnout as much as possible. So to help to avoid burnout, we can get through harvest and we can get through pruning times a lot faster. Hey, Hara, do you find that there's strains that specifically you're getting because you squish? Because because you're you're, uh, you're eventually getting rosin out of it? 100%, because some strains just don't wash at all. So you can get like a 1% or 2% return back. So... Nobody really wants that. It's not going to pay any bills. What's the normal return on a good, what do you call it, man? Something that washes well, something that squishes, squishes a good squisher? I would say 5% plus is a good starting. From the flower itself? Uh, from flower to uh, bow ash. Okay. Okay. Huh. Hey, Scotty, can I throw yes, you sir. a softball? Yes, sir. What I know for me and you, one of our biggest game changers uh, was quote the, not quote but yeah the power of microbes because I see you on here and obviously that's why one of the <laughs> yeah. one of the reasons you do what you do um, you know an old story for us is you know the first thing I figured out was what is this micro right micro I can't even pronounce it how does it help the roots and then from where we are then till now it's been amazing it's been my uh, a way that I've been able to up my grow at least a couple percent maybe I went from a seven to a nine we'll say I'll give myself credit here uh, but it's by taking uh, allowing the microbes to balance things out for me uh, when you're just feeding every single meal to the plants those plants are sensitive uh, when you do things like get mycorrhizae introduce mycorrhizae <clears throat> Uh, which is a fungus root. It's a coating that coats the roots. All of a sudden, you've expanded that root mass, that root area, its absorption capacity, and also protecting it. So stuff like that, as I learned about it, learned how to use those kind of tools, uh, uh, really helped me and uh, upped my game. So that's what I put in Real Growers Recharge. That's how I make a living. That's my company. Uh, so if you're interested, go check out realgrowers.com and learn more about Recharge and the raising mycorrhizae and all the other soil microbes. Did I share with you? If you're on my group text, you got Soil Microbes Eating, a one hour just video, and it is fascinating, man. <laughs> I'll send it to all you guys, man. Should I put it on a Saturday show? All right. I do hear from chat. One sec. Most of yes, them, sir. everybody's everybody's volumes coming through pretty pretty good. Hot rod sounds a little low. Grambo, a couple of people in the chat commenting just for some. Uh, if I can hot rod, some, raise some that volume, tips. man. All right. Yes, sir. Otherwise, yes, I think we're doing right. pretty There's good. no raise of volume, man. I'm doing a little dance because we get a little echo when uh, both Hot Rod and Scott are talking. So if you notice that Hot Rod will be a little quiet up front, I'm actually like turning them up and down to try to prevent echo. So Ooh. work with me. I'm Grambo, doing a little, a little... I'm outing you. Grambo showed up 
more high than I've ever seen him for the, than I've ever seen him in my life. And I'm like, yeah, you know, we're going live, man. And I just figure it's kind of like if we're in a band. You, you play guitar and the guitar player oh, shows yeah. up baked and you're just like, I know. Yeah, he'll be fine. <laughs> Not man. my world. It's like he does this all the time. If the guitar player shows up baked, you go, it's going to be a good <laughs> show. It's going to be a good show. Oh, man. Hey, Jeff, you got any advice for us picking strains? If I'm a, man, I'm, I'm a decent grower, is there stuff that you should uh, stay away from? Or Help me understand what's easier and what's harder. Is there anything I should be looking for? Uh, it's all about the height. Most of it is about the height. How much space do you have? And also, uh, how much time do you have? And then something else I think about is plant count. If I don't have a plant count, I pick different stuff. If I'm limited by numbers, I pick stuff that's going to spread out and grow a little, a little bit better. But consider your plant height. Uh, how tall is your floor to your light space? Right. How far from the light can your plants get? Uh, think about that. Are your plants that you want to grow, are they going to grow super tall, super fast? Right. Uh, that might not be a plant for you. Are you going to grow, uh, are you growing indoors? Are you growing outdoors? Are you growing in a greenhouse? That all makes a huge difference in selecting genes. Uh, you don't want things that are going to get super dense buds and giant flowers in a greenhouse. There's a good opportunity for powdery right. mildew and uh, bud rot and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, so it's all about strain selection. Um, think about, uh, kind of think about the buzz you want. What, like what kind of buzz are you looking for? What kind of flavor do you want? Or aromas? Because uh, those are big. Those have to be appealing to us or we're not going to want to sure. smoke it. It's sure. smell good, it's got to taste good. And then do you want, like I said, tall plants, branchy plants? Um, do the research. Are you a new grower? Read uh, some of my stuff in the notes. I will put, this is simple for beginners. And some of it I'll put, uh, this is for experienced growers. Look for those notes. Uh, How come? Like my, but is um, that because, like, you know, some are hard to clone or something? Is it like that? Uh, yeah, exactly. Some of my stuff, the, uh, all of the uh, Congo crosses are a pain in the ass to grow. They're just nutrient uh, strugglers. Sometimes I can't tell if it's too much nutrient, not enough nutrient. Um, sometimes I can't tell if those things are overfed or underfed. That plant is a pain in the ass no matter what I do to it. But then I have things like blueberry cookies that you can kick it over and piss on it, and it will pour out three pounds per <laughs> item. <laughs> seriously, that Give plant just world. grows. You can put it in a dark room and come back later and just pick up your will be just fine. Kick it over and piss on it. Quote of the live panel so far. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I didn't want to earn that title so early. But, yeah, yeah, so I love it. It's a good source of uric uh, acid. Yeah, that'll like it. Some want more nutrients uh, a lot. Some don't want a lot of nutrients. Uh, some it's real easy to figure that out, and some it's a real struggle. Uh, a lot of my Congo crosses are a pain in the ass to work with. Uh, I've got two different phenos of Jack the Ripper. One I recommend to new beginner or to new growers, and one I don't. Uh, there are phenotypes number two and four, and I sell both packs of seeds. One of them takes about two weeks longer to finish, gets much taller, what? is much more finicky with pH swings. The other one, grow it. It'll just grow. It's perfect for new growers. It's easy to grow. Uh, it'll be done in nine weeks, no problem. The other one, 11 weeks, uh, lots of struggles. So yeah, it's all about picking that right genetic for you and your room. And also uh, pay attention to leaf to calyx ratio. I'm noticing uh, a lot of breeders are listing and showing pictures of leaf to calyx ratio. Matt was talking about how much time it takes to process a plant and a crop. If you're in there trimming every leaf off of these super leafy plants, that takes time. Uh, if you've got stuff that just makes big buds with four or five leaves, uh, those are easy to trim, save you a lot of time. Hot Rod, you want more leaf to count? I mean, sometimes the leaves are filled with frost if I'm washing it. Yeah, there's still more trichomes covered on the bud than there is leaves. There's still more trichomes covered on the buds than there is leaves. So yeah, that's yeah. where I would definitely want, like he's saying, a higher um, calyx to leaf ratio for sure. Higher to... Yeah, I guess that does make sense. Sure. Sure. And bigger, a bunch of bigger buds or a bunch of smaller little popcornies for washing? Surface area, man. Yeah, I don't want anything bigger than the size of a golf ball. It's probably the biggest, I would That's say. That's what I'm thinking, yeah. Yeah, and if it is bigger than that, like some tops I do get that are bigger than that, I'll just chop them down in this golf ball size. How do you, uh, when you're trimming, are you trimming tight or... Um, just, I'm not, the, just the water leaves off or what? Yeah, pretty much just trimming the big water leaves off. And then any of my sugar leaves, I'll trim the spot that doesn't have sugar. It's the easiest way to say it. Just take your scissors, yeah. snip it at the end. Yeah. And that's literally, but I'm harvesting right off the branch, doing that quick snip, throwing it in a bag, throwing it in the freezer. So, so it freezes. And then when you're putting it in the bubble bags, are you breaking it up or? Just stirring it. So you're not, t yeah, okay. Just. Eating it up and stirring it, not Man. breaking it up or anything by if hand are, or anything beforehand. 
just totally off the subject, but I had a buddy, shout out to Motorcycle Mike, dude knows him, um, and he would make the best hash, but he would use a wooden spoon. He wouldn't be, you know, beating it all up. I'd be using the drill with the dang bit because I'd be all worried about volume. Right. Man, he would just start with a wooden spoon, get the best quality out of it, man. <laughs> you remember? That was awesome. Good stuff, man. Man, I, have, hey, I, before, I tell you what. Yes, sir. All I wanted to say quickly is it is important. It does help the channels. Comment, like, subscribe, guys. I could throw a quick one in from the chat if you want to bring the chat Please. in here. I'm trying to help, yeah. trying to help out Lee Davis. Um, he's watering in the last week, eight, eight, you know, eight, week eight of bloom. He's asking what temp water to use. And I said, are you in hydro? Um, and he said, no, cocoa. And I wonder if this is that grow hack that isn't proven or not, where if you water colder water, some people will water yeah. ice water towards ice. the end. Yeah. And for me, I don't think it's a good idea. Your rhizosphere, whatever's working down there is going to be like, holy shit, is that's cold. Like I said, room temp is fine. It, I mean, I can point this at Rasta Jeff. We're more looking at what the strain is going to genetically do and trying to do. I mean, I agree with uh, environmental air temperature being cooler, but water in cold water, or ice water, I, I don't like the idea. And that's like uh, putting your feet in cold water. Nobody enjoys that. <laughs> Very simple one liner. I like it. Somebody was giving me a grow hack about taking like a clone and putting it in the fridge. And if it turns purple, then your bud's going to turn purple. I was like, dude, that's some good bro science there. Yeah, but you know what? I'm, I believe this dude, man. All right. I believe him, man. You got to get some hey, nice Matt. purple stems. Matt, how big do y'all veg? Tell me, will you tell us real quick about your, uh, your commercial facility? Uh, a lot of people don't really understand what it's like. Like, how big is it? How many plants do you run? That kind of thing. Yeah, we got two 48 light flower rooms and a 60 light veg. So about 160 plant or 160 lights. We do 450 wow. plants per, pretty much per cycle, which we have like three cycles plus some clones going at any one max capacity time. So we're always perpetually growing. We have moms that our large six foot plus moms that we can produce 70 plus cuts off of for each run of clones um and then we're just maintaining throughout we have a four person crew including myself so we try to stay uh as limited and as efficient as possible so we do things we create we, we select strains that are easy to work with and we just try to do with the best that we can to uh, keep life easy on ourselves i'm sorry i might have spaced out how many people are working <laughs> With you? Four. Yeah, me plus <clears> three. <throat> wow. Wow. That's I mean, we a bring in a, a trim crew, obviously. We don't do all the trimming ourselves. And when sure. we pull down a, a 50 light room, we're doing it in one day. We're not doing it over the course of a couple of days. So we're going to bring in some hands to help us there, too. And you have to process it, dry it, and cure it yourselves? Like that's your responsibility yeah. as well? Yep. We, do, we handle the whole process. The only thing that we don't do is trim. Every, we do everything else that, that, that all, all, the, all the way through packaging. So I tell you what, man, and let's, let's segue into drying and curing because you want to talk about upping the quality of your game, getting a good cure, really understanding uh, how to dry and then properly cure your weed. I was talking to Banner uh, this morning and he was like, smell this. It's really starting to come into its own, you know, and it takes a little while. It, uh, things do change, man. I got a tip on that. If I can jump in, the, yes, sir. I mean, drying and curing. I've seen a few people do it. If you can implement it into the, your time and your transition of when your veg plants need to come into your main room, your your bloom room already has your environmental controls, right? So if yeah. you want to use your air conditioner intakes or whatever you need to do to make that right, we'll say 60, 60, 58, 60. We're talking difference between humidity and temperature. That's a good place to do it. Versus. I've seen people try and cram them into a tent and struggle with a little bit of a fan or the tent's getting too warm or they don't have the money, man. I know uh, commercial facilities, a lot of times, Matt, you can chime in, will have their own different room with a mini split, a dehumidifier, yeah. like everything in that room to do it. But I like if you can do it at the end of bloom in that room, I know you might have plants ready to go in there. It is a good place to do it because your equipment's already set up. I haven't been a commercial grower my whole life, so there's been other opportunities for me to play with rooms that aren't as large as what a commercial grower would provide. So yeah, in a commercial spot with state te state licensing, we have state testing, so we have to create an environment for our flower to dry and cure in the most proper environment so we can get the best out of testing that we can. Um, but 
I have also grown in a basement where I don't have a, a dry room. So yeah, having that second tiny, small, at least space started so you can have a, a constant veg cycle going. Uh, if you have to use that flower room, that gives you two weeks up to two weeks of drying in there uh, that you can start some plants in another room and get those at least started. So you're not always constantly chasing a, a whole new veg every time you flip. Yeah. Every time you try to get to flip. Yeah. How are that? How long? I mean, you, you got some connoisseur quality stuff, man. How, how long are you dry and cure for? That's what I was going to say. Right now is honestly a good time too for someone like me because I'm small scale, so I'm just running it in a tent. So at Walmart, I just noticed they're using, or they have on sale the window AC units on sale for 50 bucks. So, oh, bucks. Yeah, 50 bucks. So that's <laughs> what I, I take that, Canada. So huh? that's what I honestly do is I take those window AC units, and I know it's sad AC Infinity don't get mad, but I cut a perfect square out or a rectangle out for the window AC unit, stick that in there, and it naturally takes all the humidity out from what it would be to about 50%. And so it's good for about the first week to 10 days right. and then it'll keep it about 60% and then it'll bring it to 50% because the buds are obviously starting to get dry. So then I use an Inkbird controller with just a little cheap humidifier Sure. and that keeps me about, that humidifier will keep me at about 60% and then if I keep that AC running on max, that'll keep me around 55 degrees. So I'll just let that tent sit in the corner of a room for a month. And I don't have to worry about going in there, putting in any turkey bags, putting in any jars, going wow. in and burping it once a day. Oh. I'll just kind of... is your turkey bag. Pretty man. much. I just set it and forget it in the corner, make sure the humidifier stays full, make sure the AC's not over dripping or sure. anything, and come back in about a month, I can throw it in a jar. And like Vanner was saying, it'll definitely start curing in that progress. In the jar, yeah. Yeah, but I don't have to worry about burping it or anything <clears throat> after 10 days for three weeks or anything. I don't have time for that. I got multiple kids. I don't have yeah. time to do that. So, Matt, I'm surprised <laughs> that you have time for that. You know, it, it being in a giant commercial grow that you've got to carry it all the way through to the cure or through the cure. Quality is our number one projection. Our quality will say that again our quality is the most important part of our grow so Correct. if we can produce the most quality flower then we can maintain our price in the price point stay business to be able to pay our bills and pay our employees so we, we do everything that we can to maintain high quality we use high quality inputs we use uh, a lot of high quality stuff high, high testing strains um, and things that can really differentiate themselves to at least keep the quality up Sure. Hey, I don't even think you're giving your place a, a proper shout out. If you'd like to, go ahead, man. Sure. We are faded.mi on uh, Instagram, but we go by faded. All right. And what? Are you, so you don't retail anything yourselves? It, you're in a lot of the dispensaries? Yeah, we're in all, all the dispensaries. Not all the dispensaries. We have about 15 dispensaries that we're in, but uh, we're pretty much white labeled at this point. We only wholesale our flower out. Some people are respectable and put our name still on it, but there's other groups that. Uh, just wholesale their product and put their own packaging on it and sell it that right. way. But at this point for where we are, we're a uh, year plus into our license at this point. We're slowly transitioning into the launching that brand, but we don't want to do it in the time of winter when uh, outdoor season's hitting and the market is just saturated. You think that uh, just Ohio just legalized? I heard that's going to really affect the Michigan market. Any thoughts on that? Big time. Oh yeah, big time. Uh, it was like... They, I, uh, hooray for Ohio, and I'm happy for all of you, but it does hurt our market. So, <laughs> right. you know, it's a, it's a give and take. Yeah, I mean, is that what it's becoming as to where I'm trying to think like whiskey or something like that? I mean, there's all sorts. Of, you can buy Jim Beam or Jack Daniels, but there's all sorts of, you know, stuff they got to unlock the cabinet for. Comes in its own wood wood barrel. No, you know, so I, I mean, they've competed it, as the market matured. It became all about quality. I imagine yep. that's what we're going to see uh, in cannabis. The cream will rise. Yeah. <laughs> hey, while I, I have I, you before... Oh, go ahead. I stepped on ahead. somebody there. Go ahead, Jeff. Well, I was going to say, I'd like to agree with you that quality will rise. But what I've seen in a lot of the states that have legalized, uh, it's the race to the bottom. A lot of the uneducated consumer doesn't care about quality. They want as much for as little. Uh, people are broke right now. Things aren't like they were a couple of years ago. We're not getting free money in the mail. So people, I wish that it would be quality first, but unfortunately I'm seeing in Colorado, uh, weed is cheap and weed is free and they're just putting out as much as they can for as little as they can right now, unfortunately. I wish no, they, that the... Sorry, wish they're doing... Go ahead. 
Yeah, no, they're doing the same thing here. We we do still have a quality market, fortunately. Uh, and we have a lot of small producers that do uh, perform well, but it, they're small producers. It's not like they're trying to compete with guys who are turning over a thousand lights in a month. They're guys that are turning over 50 lights in a month and keeping your price point smaller and then doing the best that you can. Like I, like I said, we have a very small staff. We try to work 35 to 40 hours max in a week. So we're keeping costs down in other ways, but still maintaining quality inputs to be able to uh, uh, maintain our brand and our standard. It's a good role model, bro. Keep that up. Thank you. Hey, are you, Scotty, can I, are you growing can I big jump? plants? Sure, I was just going to ask. Are you growing big plants to start with, or are you growing just a bunch of little ones? Uh, we uh, So I, I veg for about a month, give or take a few days, depending about on a month? Where, within the calendar month. Yeah. In like a three or a five gallon or something like that? Start. We do a one gallon for two weeks, a two, or then a three gallon for two weeks, and then maybe like 17 days in the three gallon if we have the extra couple days. But depends on where we are in the cycle paint a picture because uh a lot of people don't get to go into a commercial grow i mean it's just thousands of plants and and how are y'all irrigating uh we hand water veg but we're using a cocoa we're using royal gold's tuper which has sure. a field a higher field capacity to re retain more water longer so we don't have to irrigate like every day in veg we can do it like every other day which again costs uh, cut costs and then sure. once we get into flower then we plug into our our irrigation system and we're not hand watering well, we hand water very limited at that capacity. And shaping the plants and pruning, uh, I'd love to get into that. I think that's a big, it uh, will certainly help with quality. You got a bunch of scragglers and I, I tell you what, Hot Rod, hop on in, man. Are you are you a big, uh, you shaping your plants and pruning? Are you a scrogger? Yeah, I'm running a trellis net, so I scrog everything out. So in veg, I'll have <clears throat> one lower trellis net down low, trying to use it to train my plants out, sure. everything down. And then when I'll flip it, I'll either use, depending on the strain, knowing, this is where we were talking about earlier, consistency yeah. and knowing what your plant's going to do and yeah. knowing your genetics. Um, but then I'll either run like an additional two, maybe three different trellis layers and let everything Jeez. stretch up into that. So a total of two, sometimes three trellis nets. Everybody trellises mad at, at the nursery or at the whatever you call it indoor facility you guys trellis as well oh absolutely we would not be in survival mode without it you could do bamboo stakes <laughs> and just have everybody wear goggles man. It's not even about goggles, that, but the bamboo you know? stakes you're not you're not going to ma maximize your your square footage of your canopy like trellising really? allows you to bend your plants around and do things to them to be able to maximize every square inch of the canopy Man, look at my body language, right? From a from a bamboo guy. Really, man. Huh? <laughs> For, uh, this is, but again, this is a on a home grow or on, on a commercial grow. Commercial We have to maintain a yeah. bottom line. We have to be able to produce a certain amount of flour to. Uh, to survive so in order for us to do that we have to maximize our our uh our square footage every every sure. time that we get the the amount of labor i have a buddy that has an eight lighter running bamboo and the amount of stakes you got to put in would be insane i mean i get it i have to move my plants i think scotty True. likes to move his plants around that's, that's the yeah. only reason i don't use trellising but so, um, we we stay our moms but, but that's our moms are seven eight foot tall plants that are producing a, up to 100 cuts if we needed it so like those we don't want to tip over and they're in a 10 gallon pot so we're, we put enough volume of water and it's usually to keep it top heavy water it twice a day sometimes but we're making sure that the plant's not going to tip over so the bamboo stakes have their purpose we're, and no offense we're not using bamboo in the in the commercial spot either yeah no, I'm, no I'm not offense. offended sir i'm not <laughs> i'm not with the bamboo steak industry man uh scotty no, let me jump yes, in sir. i know i know Please. you got flushing coming up i'm excited to hear about some opinions that's a very opinionated <laughs> you well, look like you'd be on the uh, toilet right now dude well we had matt uh i see you're wearing that 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 canna jacket there canna's merch gears up on point i remember the dgc cup i think i gave warehouse kyle like a knife they had like golf club covers <laughs> all kinds of interesting shit but canna has been around uh, with us as long as the show's been around for almost 10 years now and they were one of yeah, the first right? sponsors of our show and they're still right. hanging out and they still got bad at shit so like i was saying earlier in the show when i asked uh, a commercial grower i like to ask commercial growers about their inputs in this day and age especially because it's so different than what it was back in the day you could afford to put a lot of different shit in your regimen and be like i think this is working this is good i'm getting a lot of money who cares let's yep. buy this it's not like that anymore and i see you run uh yeah what do you run from canada 
Um, I'm running their base along with boost and PK 1314. So, okay. Yeah. Now, knowing that Canna quote is a premium nutrient in my mind, sometimes more expensive than under other nutrients on the shelf, like is that a decision just out of consistency, quality, all the above. Yeah, consistency, quality. I'm not one of these guys that have lots and lots of followers that get solicited for free nutrients from certain companies, especially right. in commercial <coughs> agriculture. Sure. Um, but I, I like to stick with something that's going to consistently give me a high quality product, and I'm hitting some percentages that I've never hit in my life. So, And I'm not necessarily contributing to just the canna itself, but it's all part of that system that, that allows the wheel to turn. Shout out, is, shout out, yeah. shout out. It is funny that none of y'all have mentioned nutrients or the, you know, your bloom boosters or anything like that. <laughs> bloom boosters. Yeah, I mean, if you were to go to the grocery store, you know, at least back in the day, that would be the, you know, they'd show you the, well, you need this, what was it, the Fox Farm Trio, the Beastie Blooms, <laughs> and... Buzzwell. Yeah, yeah. But, well, Budswell was cool, man, because that was just uh, bat guano. You know, but... Uh, Budswell. Yeah, yeah, there's nothing wrong with little, little uh, bugs. Come on. But what about that, man, as far as how important are nutrients if you're going to up your game? So we've got a good environment. Uh, we've got uh, good genetics. And are we putting nutrients third? I would agree. Gear, nutrients, uh, genetics, those are the top three. That's what. That's like the engine, the tires, and I'm not a car guy, so you fill in the fucking third one. But right. Yeah, that's all the <laughs> it needs interior, man. You need leather, okay? That's it. There you go. The leather. Base. So the nutrients are the leather, bro. The, the nutrients <laughs> are the leather. Make it so nice if you want. I'll shout out to Canna when I first showed up in Colorado. Uh, I wanted to uh, put out a really good product. I shout out my buddy Corey over at Way to Grow. I tell this story. I said, how do I compete? He said, Canna Cocoa and Canna A and B, 10 gallon smart pots, and you're good to go. And it was easy to get good quality out of it. Um, yeah, and, uh, as far as nutrients go, I don't know, Hot Rod, what are you using? I run Drip Hydro. I'm running in Grower's Choice Cocoa. I switched up from. So Power wait, so I just want to make sure Cocoa, because I'm a big Cocoa, 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 Cocoa fan. Cocoa fan. Yep. Anybody else growing in Cocoa? Commercially, I do Cocoa in a personal grow soilless mix. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. But um, I switched up and now I'm running uh, the Silicium. Because it, uh, instead of Power SI, so that's the only change I made. But just making sure you got quality inputs. Don't go to Home Depot and buy, you know, Miracle Grow or something like that. No. Just make sure uh -uh. you spend some decent money. There's a million brands out here now that have spent millions of dollars in research to do a good formulation on different synthetic nutrients and stuff. So we got Grow Dots, which is super simple to run if you just want to run a one part. I like Drip Hydro. I know. Um, Jeff runs um, New Millennium, which is a great product. A lot of people have run New Millennium and won cups and stuff with it. So. Sure. I tell you what, man, Jeff, tell me about that. Jaron, friend of the show, uh, he's a local, so when he shows up with that bud, it does. That's 10 bud in my opinion. A scale from 1 to 10, that's a 10. And, of course, you scratch your head and go, yo, man, what are you doing? And a lot of it is strains, but... Uh, I do believe in his nutrients, man. It's, it's New Millennium. What, what are you running, Jeff? Tell me about it. I know you run New Mill. I got mostly the New Mill base with the uh, the Autumn Gold, the Spring. I don't remember the names of them. I got the Equinox in there, the Ruby, uh, the Ruby Fulvic. But I also add Bud Swell to that. And then for flowers, uh, I add Shine from Veg Bloom. I think the Shine adds some bulk into there. And then uh, the Green Sensation. Green Sensation makes shit just go shebang, dude. Like... Uh, nobody pays me. I'm not sponsored by any new sure. company. I notice a difference when I'm using Green Sensation. Just a little beefier product. So yeah, yeah, What is the, that uh, stuff? I forgot yeah. that existed. What is that again? Is that the Playground stuff? Yeah, from Playground. Oh, yes. yes. I'm sorry. Yes, he did give me some of that. Oh, You're right. Stripe yep. model, I think it is. Yep. Yeah. That's, that's okay. good shit right there. It's, it's a little standy, but I think it's worth it. For the personal growth, it works real well. And keep in mind... Probably 75% of my cultivation is for seed. So I do things a lot differently when it's for seed. Like you guys were talking about drying and curing, and I was just giving. Right. I was like, I don't have to do that part. You guys were talking about trimming. I was like, hey, I don't have to do that part. So, what yeah, do you mean, yeah, though? Oh, because you are. Seeds yeah, I don't have to trim it. I'm not selling buds. There's no Got flower it. to come out of it. Just Got all seed. It. I hang the plants upside down and go like this to them. 
and hear the seeds rain out into a bin, yeah, much easier. <laughs> hey, you said your personal grow and your commercial grow. What's your commercial grow like? Currently, uh, I'm not working a commercial grow right now. I've been, uh, for several years, I've been a, a consultant at multiple commercial grows. Got so it. I don't have one grow. I just go there and basically work with the lead cultivator and devise a plan for that facility that works best. Uh, so I'm just going traveling around. I drive up and down I-25 and hop in and check on a grow and then drive down and check on another one, tell the crew what to do and tell the crew what to do and go back next week and hope they did it. Really? How do you get the, that job? Yeah, it's a fun job. It's a fun yeah. job. Man, how long have you been a commercial grower, Matt? Uh, I've been doing it commercially for 10 years now. Is it a fun job still? Yeah, it is. It's not. <laughs> it is. It's, yeah. Like, especially like now when I have a crew around me, that is awesome. You know, when that when you have no animosity, everybody likes to show up to work. Everybody has a good time, jams the same music, smiles and wants to be there with each other. Right. It makes life so much easier. Yeah. I agree. That's one of my favorite parts of running commercial cultivation is the crews. Like I make a rule, whoever shows up first for the day picks the music. So like people are like, oh, I'm going to get their song on my hand. Nice. You know, whoever comes back from lunch first, you pick the music. Is there uh, veto yeah. power? It does, and those things go a long way. It's got to be right. Long way. Yeah, there is sometimes, veto power in my grow. There is. Yeah. <laughs> the St. Elmo's Fire soundtrack on, you know what I mean? Good stuff. <laughs> when, they start, when they start the rave in the grow, it's a little bit too much for me. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're right. That's funny. That's funny. So hey, but so even we... having that atmosphere around, you know, it's it's good for the plants too. The plants know and feel that good energy, and you know, having that constantly around, they also perform well for you. Do y'all really think that if I were if loving and her eyes would hear, she would say that you know the the best thing a plant can see is your shadow. Did I do that right? Yeah. Meaning the more you. <laughs> The more you hang out in the grow, the more you hang out with the plants, the better they perform. Uh, I don't, I'm going to go around the panel with this one, man. How, Rod, do you believe that? Yeah, I definitely feel like your plants can sense when you're in there or not. I don't know if that's just because they get a CO2 boost in there, if you're not using CO2 always, boost yeah. or not. But they're definitely living plants. I think they can feel your energy. Like I don't want to be too hippy-dippy about it, but yeah. I think they can definitely sense when you're in there. Dude, these plants in this grow right now, you know, like I didn't do much to them. I was like, I never opened the tent, but I was always hanging out with them. You know, they pretty much performed, man. Nice. Jeff? Uh, no, I definitely feel like the plants know we're there, and uh, they feel us as much as we feel them. When you go outside, don't you feel the trees and the... Like, if you just go stand in a field, you feel that something from the trees and the dirt and all the, the bushes around you. And if you go to a different environment with different trees and different bushes, you'll feel a different way. The plants have to feel something from us. <clears throat> they have to. That's my opinion. Yeah, I, there's no doubt in my mind that we're connected to them. I had a couple weeks span where I was just not in a good place and the plants did not look good either. And I finally <laughs> had that I finally had that one breakthrough good feeling good day and I walked into the room and they were all up praying. So Really? It could be they was at that point where I was like there could be something else here. You know, there's a there's a there's a feeling that you have. You know, I like call me whatever, but I kiss my plants goodnight every night, you know, tell them that I'll be <laughs> back tomorrow and wow. I'll sleep tight and then Nice. I'm on back the next day. And if I'm not, I tell them who's going to be there taking care of them. You don't make them call you daddy, do you? <laughs> I don't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> Man, uh, I, I just do think it's funny that like nutrients are so down on the line. You know, do you have any, uh, Jeff, you mentioned buds well. Do you all have any, uh, I, I would say recharge is a big, is a big one. Uh, that would be my pick. If you all had, we're looking at the hydro, we're at the hydro store, or the grow store. Pick me one thing that you would say, hey, this is pretty good. I met you mentioned silicium. Yeah, silicium definitely because it was one of the only products I saw at the store that had monosilicic acid. I thought Power SI was, but then I looked at the back and it's potassium silicate. Is it really? Yeah. The so. difference between those two is potassium silicate's five grams per gallon with a lot of potassium. You know, a teaspoon per gallon, uh the monosilicic acid is a half of uh We're still recommending the point so five if I'm not well, mistaken, so I was Jeff, sorry if i'm not mistaken if jeff maybe you know this too or can chime in uh i don't believe any company can advertise as a monosilicic acid anymore so you'll see that it says potassium silicate but if it's a three mils per five gallon that's typically a monosilicic. It's got that thickness to it. Yeah, it's thick, and it says sure. 25 mils per gallon still, so that's right. why I was just super confused. 
Man, that ten times it's stronger. I believe if it's a labeling thing, and it, like it's speaking of labeling thing, and silicium is a great product. Uh, but if you look at the bottle of silicium and a bottle of Felic uh, Facilitor, they are the exact same wording and the exact same font. Everything is there, and silicium is actually quite a bit cheaper. Yeah, I mean that's a single input product there. You know, it's a orthosilicic acid, right? Or monosilicic. Don't Mono. get me started. Don't get me started, sir. All right. Don't, <laughs> leaning, don't make me call leaning Jared. On, leaning on new mill a little bit. Uh, I, I like winter frost. I don't, don't leave the garden without winter frost. I hit my plants just before uh, what we can call it flush. Um, right. Every time with, uh, with, I try to do two days if we can afford it. If not, we're doing like one day at least hit with, uh, with winter frost. And how many days is that beforehand? How are you using it? So we do, uh, I, I like to, like, I think we wanted to talk about flush a little bit, but flush, like, for me, is sure. more um, not necessarily flushing, but it's a, a way to save money as far as, like, not having to use nutrients. Um, when, I, when I'm doing a feed throughout the life of the, the plant in veg, I'm starting with a really high EC, and I'm not getting to any runoff, so I'm building up a lot of the nutrition within the media, and I'm not hitting runoff until I'm about the first week of flower. And then I, when I'm at that point, I can start tapering off my, my EC of my input. And um, then when I get to about 18 days before harvest, that's when I hit winter frost for two days and I'll go straight water the rest of the way. If I'm 18 days? Yeah, so wow. it's 16 days of straight water. Yeah. Wow, How do your plants look at the end? How Are they faded, faded. out? Or, are, they, are they dropping it's, some leaves? They're... Yeah. The, they, you get that, certain strains the the leaves just curl up and die certain strains are the easy nice ones that you can just pick off real quick but uh for the most part it's the plants have consumed themselves thus the name faded so if you're hitting the market with quality flour i just wanted to note that um with that amount of time i know some people have said well we like to water in at 400 500 ppm or a lower ec which maybe doesn't cost as much but that definitely at your volume of mixing tanks saves you money and you still well, have quality yeah, I'm I could easily mix up a, thank you. I could easily mix up a 0.5 EC feed and feed it the rest of the way through. But why do that when I can get the same results? I'm still hitting my two and a half to three alight, whatever I need to hit for the time. Excellent. And I'm saving 18 days worth of nutrients. Nice. And you've seen it. You worked the same strains. You've done it A B testing, and you've seen that. Uh... So, and here's the other part. And Jeff can, I'm sure, can attest to this too. If that strain doesn't work well within my system, then that strain doesn't work within my facility. <laughs> oh, it's like a threat. <laughs> well, it is like it's you, you pop seeds third, too, right? Okay. You, see, you pop seeds and you get that one that's laced with thrips right off the rip. You got six plants there, and one of them just is crawling with thrips. Like it, that one just really? obviously is not going to work without within my system. So that one's going to hit the garbage before anything. There's man, there's that much variation, huh? So what oh, would yeah. make so one would be more? Yeah, I guess you are right, man. I had to have plants that just uh, the bugs love them. Bugs, mold, mildew, every bugs they got res uh, resistance or prone to it. Yeah. yeah. Not even spider mites like Blue Dream. <laughs> no, <Nah, laughs> really? There are plants that are just bulletproof? Yeah, they won't fuck with the Blue Dream plants for some reason. They stay off of it. And I have a so friend, when she trims Blue Dream, she gets a huge rash on her arms. So if there's something in the Blue Dream that's keeping the bugs and giving her a rash. Wow. Hey, Jeff, man, you're a great friend of the show. If I'm looking, say that I'm a pretty good grower and I'm looking to grow something that's going to, uh, man, you know, I'm a frost whore. I want it to look good. But uh, what would you recommend, man? What would you recommend uh, as far? Yeah. Of course, I'm going to go with something from my line. In the fem line, I'm going to sure. say the 4K. The 4K is super frosty, ridiculously frosty. Uh, in the reg line, I would probably say fist bump or... Um, What's another one? Red line. Fist bump and red line are super frost bosses. If you're going to wash it, go for the red line. If you're going to smoke flour, go for fist bump. Interesting. Hey, and uh, how come you do regs and, uh, and fems? Is there a difference? Like, I'm sorry, is there a difference in the output? Uh, a lot of, uh, well, fems, when I make seeds, fems make about half as many seeds, to be honest with you. But sure. uh, the market, the new growers, a lot of people don't have room for uh, male plants. They can't run 10 seeds and cull males. Uh, they're growing in a small spot. They need to know that the three seeds they potted are three girls. They'll get to flower and smoke. Yeah, so yeah. A lot of those people want, they require fem seeds. Uh, but then they're the purists. Like a lot of the old school growers won't even mess with fems because uh, they think there's uh, it's uh, it's not healthy for the, the community or the plant or the life of the plant. 
are purists in some way, so they don't want to mess with the fens. So I got to make regs for them. And also it's easier to make regs with some things because I've got a male and a female, uh, but some things it's impossible to make regs because I don't have the male. So that's, you have to make fens of some stuff. It's all about availability is half of it. And then what will sell is the other half, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Good answer, man. Well, are we still talking? Too. Are we still going to talk lighting in a minute if everybody's hanging? I had to, yeah. uh, I'm going to do a, sh a shout out to uh, the DDC producers, man. You guys, uh, if you don't know, they make this panel happen. Actually, everybody here is kind of, I think, met through the DDC. We've all been friends for a bit now, and it's been such a cool community. Uh, we wouldn't have it all possible without the DDC producers. So check out dudegrows.com forward slash support. Your producers listening in by the end of the week here. Uh, I'm going to put up a post and hook up some Irie genetics. Go figure. Uh, we got Blueberry Butcher. We got Jack Tripper. We got Whitechapel, Inspector Royale, and Sour Glow in stock. So stay tuned. You guys will get hit right through your email you signed up with when that post goes live uh, to get your hands on some genetics to give back to you guys making the show happen. Nice. Dugros.com forward slash support. Respect. Yeah. All right. I got to ask. Hot Rod, how old are you, man? You don't have to tell me, but. 27. 27. Do you have any idea who Jack Tripper is? No. Ah, I see, man. Grambo, you're the cable guy. Do you know who Jack Tripper is? I actually don't. I don't know wow. Jack Tripper. Oh, really? Three's Company. Back okay. in the day, it was very risky. Well, while I'm here, I have to uh, I have to ask. Uh, Rasta Jeff, could you do that? Thing? What did you throw up? Did you throw up a DGC uh, like gang sign <laughs> thing there? <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that. I was, I was like, that's the coolest thing ever. I'm going to like yeah, throw up some DGC, man. He's from Pueblo, all right, man. <laughs> that's how they do it. I got to stretch first. I'm getting old. <laughs> My man. Oh, shit, man. Nice. Hey, man, you guys want to talk a little lighting? Because there is a big difference, man, right from the start, man, when you got your lights dialed in. What uh? Yeah. About, yeah, I mean, first off, as far as just uh, Matt in a commercial setting, what do you? I mean, I imagine you're measuring PPFD all the time. Uh, yeah, what are you hitting? I mean, what are you even in cloning? I'm notice I'm hitting 200. I'm still always tinkering with things and trying to find out what's best for the plants. And obviously, some strains work better with more light or less light, and trying to figure out which ones work better. And then there's parts within the garden when you're like a, a, along a wall that doesn't have the extra, like we have DEs, we don't have the extra row of lights hitting the plants sure. in a certain way. They're not getting as much PVFD as like some of the plants maybe in the middle of the room. Um, so we have to kind of select plants based on that too. But uh, in veg, we're, we're starting like around 350 or so. And we have start to increase our lights slowly. We're using HLG 350s in, uh, right. in veg. And we, we started about 50% uh 50 uh, percent wattage sorry i'm blanking here and Yay. then we're, we're increasing that incrementally every time we feed so we'll do a watering and then we'll increase it five to six percent and then we'll like a couple of days later we'll do another watering and we're increasing it again and we max out roughly with those lights there those are intense lights we're not uh going really past uh 85 to 87 percent at any one time are they digital is that, is that digital? Because, man, I turn my lights up. I've got HLG 350s. I turn them up just from, like, 30 to 50. And, uh, man, burnt the crap out of my plants. It's fairly dangerous. But you, but you hear everybody's like, oh, 1,200 PPFD in flowering. I've never been able to get that high, man. Like, at the top of my canopy, at the very, like, when the plants stretch to the most stretchiest that they can stretch to, because we're not, like, moving my lights up and down in, in uh, flower, uh, the the top end that we're seeing is about 1100 to 1150. We're not really getting anywhere past that. And honestly, not all strains get that entire uh, max capacity every every grow. Yeah. How much light you run, man? You got what tents? Uh, so I got. Yeah, so I got one tent with the HLG uh, Scorpion R spec going in it, and basically it's. I can adjust that one because there's more room in the tent and with the trellis net and everything going. Right. So I got probably about six to eight inches I can play with that one. But then I also got a few HPS lights hanging in the basement. They're double-ended 1,000 Gavitas. Gavitas. Yeah, the Gavitas. <laughs> so they're kind of as high as I can get them already. And then I got the fast fit stands. So I only have so much <laughs> work, uh, height to work with. So yeah. My trellis, the first trellis net is only six inches off of the 
pots basically. Right. So I, just, I mean, I'm bending those things like crazy, and then if some light or some of the buds, unfortunately, like right underneath them, yeah. do get kind of bleached out and everything so that's unfortunate but i can't really do much about it like right. if some stuff stretches more than it does i'm stuck but i was talking to rasa jeff all the time and he was teaching me about bending and popping the branches when so they're stretching thinking, to yeah. try and slow stuff down and everything so definitely try to there's ways to mitigate it and the plants that are right underneath the exact middle of that hps right. you definitely try and train them away from that so there's ways i can mitigate it but as far as structurally, do you think there's a, you can get better quality if you do a, the right job of uh, trimming or growing the right size plant? I think you can definitely train your plant going from big, like, I don't want to use the D word, um, <laughs> from baseball bats would be a perfect way to basically a bunch of little golf balls. So yeah. if you just train it all, instead of it all just being that one top, or they green. all just kind of start turn or over Christmas to the side trees. Yeah. yeah they always turn to the side and make a bunch of little golf balls so that makes your trimming work a little bit easier if you know you're going to have mold issues with some strains because they're so big sure you can try and make that top hole a little bit smaller by training it out and everything a little bit like that too yeah makes sense man makes sense you think uh hey matt you, you're the kind of guy that that actually does research as far as one big cola compared to uh, like a scrog where you're able to weave it in and out you get more more for, uh, I guess overall yield or yield in quality from the scrog. I guess I haven't done like a one-to-one -one comparison to say yes right. that is absolutely true but in my experience what I've noticed is that you do get probably instead of getting like one giant ounce cola you get like um, maybe six quarter colas right so you're getting like a little bit more but it's not like extremely noticeable does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Why do you want all that biomass anyway? I think they've had more problems with bigger buds than more medium-sized buds. As far as just, I want some surface area of trikes. I've seen bud yeah. rock come into my that one strain big bud. Bring me the big bud. <laughs> it brought me big bud problems. I had to buy it. All right. It said big bud. All right. <laughs> so, yeah. More... Hey man, I got one for Rasta Jeff. All right. I, we hear this on the show all the time and. I don't know how to answer it, man. What is up with like with alternative light schedules? Do any of y'all do alternative light schedules? And Jeff, I know that you do what the eighteen six the last week. Uh, about ten days, yeah, eighteen six at the last ten days of flower uh, on a flower crop. If I'm seeding the crop, if it's pollinated, uh, I did that for the last six weeks of flower on a seeded what? crop. Oh, okay, on a seeded crop. Yeah, if it's seeded, yeah, if I'm making seeds, I start uh, way early with the eighteen six. I started this idea when I was making seeds. Uh, in my opinion, experience, light is the number one source of energy for the plant. That's what makes everything happen. Agreed. When I started growing for seed, uh, I wanted the most uh, healthy, viable seed I could pull in, as many of them as I could per harvest. And I thought, give them more light, and the seeds come out healthier and stronger. So I just thought, give them even more light, and then give them even more light. And then eventually, I just started turning the timer back to 18. So what happened was I was trying to re-veg something. It had, I had a, sure. a seeded crop and I wanted to re-veg it. So I turned the light to 18.6 uh, at the last two weeks of flower to speed up my re-veg. And then I noticed the seeds were monstrous and they finished like a week early. So I thought, what if I do this earlier? I can re-veg my plants and I can get the seeds done quicker. I don't always need to re-veg, but sometimes I like to. So it came out of a re-veg idea. A seeded room got re-veg so I could take clones of that and rerun the room again and have those genetics. So it's kind of where I learned it. And then I just started doing that on all the seeded crops. But for the flower runs, I noticed it makes the flowers finish like three or four days sooner. They come out a little more dense, uh, and it just seems like better product to me. They're denser and done earlier. And that's always a bonus. Wow. Yeah. yeah 18 sacks for the last uh, 14, 10-ish days. I would recommend it. And a week it, for sure. And they don't start to re-veg at all. You don't start seeing... Uh... Yeah. You know, leaves coming out least, of the buds. It takes at least three weeks, at least 17 to 21 days for a re-veg to start. Let's hear it, Matt. I'm curious. Yeah, so I'm curious. Did you uh, have any testing done to know whether you have any, like, terpene loss or uh, THC loss, like, using the extra light during that time? Uh, I'm growing. That's in a personal grow. And in Colorado, we can't technically test our personal grow that way. I can okay. probably figure out how to make it happen. But, no, I have not tested it. But just visually Because I'm looking, curious about trying... I mean, what, how, the reason it makes sense to me is because we're running, typically we run three cycles of 63 days and then a four cycle of 67 days. 
that makes our year split up really easy when we have 11 cycles a year. Um, that 67 day harvest is always heavier, like quite a bit heavier. So I'm cu curious if I took that three days worth of 12 hours, so 36 hours, and I split that up between six hour sessions for six days, is that going to give me the same increase in yield? I don't have the math, but in my we'll theory, try. please do let me know. Please send me some data. Yeah, we'll I'd love to see what you do. Yeah. And a lot of people tell me I'm a lunatic and I'm crazy, but you know who tells so, me I'm crazy is people who haven't done it. The people that have tried it, I've never gotten negative feedback. So it's only people that haven't done it that are afraid sure. of it to tell me I'm fucking retarded. Well, the plants aren't going to change that fast within a week span to know that, you know, it's time to start popping out some reveg. You know, they're, they're not going to transition that quick. So you can you can do a lot of little slips throughout the cycle and the plants are going to be pretty resilient about it. So you could just do this at the end and watch their resiliency yeah yeah it's interesting man. have you all ever messed with uh like 14 hours of darkness or going into more more darkness at the end to try to get them to finish faster so i personally haven't sorry Jeff. i personally haven't what i do do is i do the 24-hour dark period before we harvest but again this is like we already know we're hitting our yields this is a way for me to save power so if i do this 11 times a year, that's six and a half days or five and a half days. Worth of Jeez, power. you got the, you got the wow, spreadsheets man. out, baby. I love it. You're it's like, a business, bro. It's a every business. Every counts in this industry now. Every kilowatt every, every, is. Like, yeah. like Jeff said, it's a race to the bottom at the end of the day. But if I want to be able to maintain a, a high standard product that everybody's going to love to get their hands on, I don't want to smoke garbage weed. I don't want to smoke uh, for our, our some of our big brands that are out there that are mass producing just trash at 600 a pound wholesale or less. I want to smoke something that's high quality, just like Jeff likes to smoke some dabs that are really high quality. We like the flavor and the other enhancements that we get from flower, not just I want to get high. Man, how do you do 600 pounds and still stay in business? You know, $600 pounds, you know? Yeah, you know, exactly. it goes lower than that. It goes lower than that. I actually oh, pay for power. Jeez, man. That's interesting that you've done the math, though, man. So does any, anybody got any tricks for, say, finishing uh, faster? Or you just said, like, the 24-hour dark period? Or at least for, uh, you know, end of flower, last week of flower tricks? Can I chime in on one? Yeah, come on, man, come All on. All right. I just noticed out of this whole conversation with lighting that um, the two tips I'd give, one, I've, I've seen too many growers, not too many growers, I should say growers learning that they don't need so as much light in veg by dimming down their LEDs and turn saving money in HVAC costs, heat, right. and getting right. really good results. Measure it, of course, if you can. Um, and then the end of flower. I feel, you know, outside, it's a different light from the sun in fall. It's not as intense. I can't mimic it in my indoor grow, but some growers talking about dimming their LEDs and bringing, they're already trying to bring temperatures down potentially maybe dimming the LEDs. They don't need to be 100% the last 10 days uh, to yeah. two, I don't know about two weeks. But yeah, I was curious if any of you guys have messed with that. Yeah, dude, the temperature thing, I'm super curious about. Good point, man. Any of y'all bring the temperatures down to bring any kind of fall colors, as the dude would say? I like to try to do that in the personal grow and the commercial grow. Yeah, bring the temps down a little bit. That's helpful, especially in the winter here in Colorado. Why not bang it down five or 10 degrees cooler if you can? Yeah. And that... that Cooler temperature will help you get rid of bugs too. If you have any spider mites or mm, something, they don't like to they hate it. Slow them down. Yeah. yeah. Matt, what about you guys? Worried? Just worried about VPD? And that, no, that's kind of I a... mean we can we you want to oversize or you want to oversize your room your equipment for your room so that you can do whatever you want within the room. So we can bring our temperatures down by the time we're done. Uh, our leaf surface in the room when the AC kicks on, it's going to be like 70, 69, 70 degrees. When the AC is about to, or I'm sorry, when the uh, AC is done kicking on, it's 69, 70 degrees. When we're like uh, hitting just to the point where the AC is about to kick on, it, the leaf surface is only 76 to 78. So it stays cooler parameters within the room. You know, it does help bring that fall color out. It does. So you guys dim lights? Does anybody have dim dimmable lights? I'm just we could dim you... lights, but we, we don't. Um, I just don't like I I guess it's like all for what purpose are you growing for? If you're a home grower and you don't care about yield, then yeah, definitely you could dim your light stack. Well, but we, we want to make sure about yield. <laughs> well we just talked about getting enough get, that light is the energy and getting that energy to the plant. So in my opinion, I'm I'm staying at yeah. a thousand watts just to make sure that I'm getting the most of my plants at all times. Feel you? Sure. Sure. When I changed from HPS to LED, I roasted a full crop, to be completely honest with you. 
I didn't know how to adjust the LEDs. I didn't know how high, how low. Uh, roasted them, bro. They look like barbecued leather plants after 10 days in flower. Yeah, learning the LEDs was a whole new ball game. It was a yeah. Whole, it was a, like a completely different grow. You know, man, I'm learning myself just having these super overpowered LEDs that you got to dial up slowly. Yeah, I will shout out. And to sometimes the never hit hundred percent. Like you, sometimes you don't want to go all the way. If the plants are reacting negatively to the amount of light that they're getting, if they just don't look good, then it's likely that you're overdoing it to pull back a little bit. Especially yeah. like if we talked about at the beginning of the show, where all the parameters around it are good, then you can then say, okay, maybe I'm doing too much light because my plants are looking like shit. But yesterday before I turned them out, they actually look good. So right. Yeah, some of the HLGs that I got, they're so powerful. And flower, I'll turn them up to about 80, 90% max. I don't hit 100%. I mean, maybe if I supplemented CO2 at yeah. you know, 1,400 parts per million or something, but yeah. just that ambient, there's no way my plants are needing anything above 80%. They start definitely getting, you can tell they're not praying towards the light anymore. They get right. upset. Yeah, I will shout out to HLG. I told them my, the, the DGC pros, but I told them the size of my room. They sent four of those 350s. Those are good lights. But they are, yeah. So I've got mine at down mine up from 30 to 50%. Uh, and I was just going in the bloom. Ruined everything, man. Ruined <laughs> them. Yeah. The size of my room is uh, uh, five feet wide by 11 feet long. And they sent me six 350 Diablo X's. <laughs> no. Yeah, and me he's too. like, me Brock too. was like, he's like, it might be, it might be a little too much, but you know, you have enough. <laughs> it's like, all right, all right, I like that. But that's daring me to want to turn it up. You know, I really do want to get it to where I got a uh, eleven or twelve hundred PPFD at the canopy. And Jeff, do you? Uh, do you recommend when you're looking at your seed catalog do, or you know descriptions? Do you say, oh, this one wants a lot of light or a little light? You know, because of a lot of new rules and laws, I don't give a lot of descriptions. I'm not allowed to say this one wants a lot of light or this one doesn't want a lot of light on a site where I sell seeds. Do you find that crazy regulation? Oh, trust me, man, I get it. Man. Um, do you? Yeah, there uh... are some plants. There are some plants that absolutely want more light. The uh, the Congo, the Jack Tripper. Yeah. And all of the crosses would be really okay with little light the flow crosses would be fine with if you just kind of dim the lights a lot but that congo turn the light up all sure. the way she'll climb will... up into it she doesn't care she'll go push the light up out of the ceiling for you so it can get taller sure man i'm just thinking about scrogging compared to the bamboo stakes and man it is like an upside down triangle with the amount of light that's coming so um, to be able to just level your canopy and just get nothing but tops and just dial in the PPFD right there, right at your top canopy About level. 18 to 24 inches thick is kind of ideal when you're getting that dialed in because you know that light's going to get right in there. Oh, yeah. Even taller. 18 to 24, pretty, pretty ideal. Yeah, it's pretty cool, man. Pretty cool, man. I have enjoyed hanging out, dude. What do you got, man? I've enjoyed it as well, man. We love learning in public, getting a, a panel of growers, and especially like when uh, Roster Jeff and Michigan Matt go back and forth on their own. I'm just sitting back, soaking it in. I know. Um, yes. Learning some yes. stuff from Hot Rods over there, hanging out. Should we give some shout-outs to you guys, uh, where you're at, your social media, and what's what's going on? Yeah, man. Hot Rod, you got social media, man? Do you uh, promote? Yeah, just on Instagram, Hot Rods underscore Headstash. And man, you know, do you actually show uh, plants and stuff like that? On there all day, every day. God, what's your backup account? <laughs> yeah. Crazy bitch. Matt, man. how about you, man? I'm on my backup account. <laughs> <laughs> so it's what Michigan you... Matt 2.0. All right. All right. Thank yeah. you. Hey, you guys have been great, honestly, man. Um, hey, Matt, and give the name of your, uh, your dispo, not dispo. Your grow brand, your cannabis faded. brand. We are faded. Faded. All right, man. I like it. Thank you. Don't they know you're canceled? Is that when it's 2.0? They yeah. are. Yeah. Okay. okay. Everybody's got He's backup. Like, I was. Counts. I was. I was bigger than this. Oh, we got canceled, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Ross to Jeff, Mister Irie Genetics, yourself, man. Yeah. Tell me some great uh, stuff. Find me on Instagram, Irie underscore Genetics. Check out the website, Irie Direct. And if you're watching live in 30 minutes, I will be live on Instagram, uh, Irie underscore Genetics. Really? Damn, man's working. He is working. working <laughs> I'm gonna cook burgers and hang out with Hot Rod and Grambo. Man. That's the that's the rep on our roster, Jeff. Is that he is an Iron Man? How many hours a day you stream? You suppose, Jeff? 
Oh, I'm on Discord most of the. No, day. that's what I'm saying. I'm Usually, I, I hear yeah. about your your Iron Man streaks on a Discord, but uh, yeah, you're, you're <laughs> what ten hours a day, oh, something like that. And just hanging out all day. I'm not there then, but you know, I'm, I'm right. hanging out a lot. Yeah, that's I'm a lurker. That's awesome. I, <laughs> I love whenever I hear about the people, like the the homies that hang out with the people all day and right. chat. Love it. So yeah, shout out, uh, Irie, Irie Army. Come hang out on the Irie Army Discord. You'll find us. Yeah, I'm a lurker too. I'll be I'll be lurking on the YouTube sometimes, man. <laughs> <laughs> I see you over there, Grambo. Oh yeah, we me and Scott always send each other like screenshots of like the the crazy stuff we find in the chat and stuff. Oh, so man. yeah, we see you. If you guys uh, post stuff on uh, there, we see it. We, <laughs> we interact. It's fun. Oh man, good stuff, Grambo. Yeah. You kept it together, sir. Uh, yeah, I had a little extra time. Even well, I was pretty high. Yes, yeah, Scott's referencing. I was a little <laughs> a little high today, yeah. but uh, I had a dentist appointment. I didn't like it. So uh, I took a little extra dentist editing. high. On accident. Oh, it uh, sounds like the worst experience, man. I have done it once. <laughs> I don't do it anymore, man. Yeah, Especially was... early in the morning, wake and bake, and you go to the dentist. Uh-uh. Yeah, uh, but this was an awesome show. Thank you guys for hanging out. Every this Monday we're doing this, and yeah. No. All right, Rod, thank you for coming up, man. I appreciate it, brother. Thank you, guys. Heck yeah, man. All right, y'all. Dude, I'll say good st- BSing, stay man. Stay hot. Stay higher, DGC. As I say, comment, like, subscribe. It sounds maybe cheesy, but it does help uh, push the channel out, push Prohibition down, and gets us into that funky algorithm AI area. I don't even know what to say, but that funky algorithm, baby. <laughs> but yeah, I'm out, guys. Stay uh, high. Uh, peace out. Appreciate you. Absolutely. Take her easy, dude. It's dab time. <laughs> Guys, that was fun, man. That was... uh...